definition, but the uh, granite curving is a topic of discussion. So just to set the stage, the curving was $78,000, $765 in the funding we received. And that was for standard granite curving all around, which is a six inch reveal. Um, but there's been some concerns about possible safety issues with the kids, as well as maintenance. If um, maintenance comes in at some of the other options, but for safety, if you have a six inch reveal, the kids are in the middle here playing, there's a concern that they might trip off of it into the pavement. So we wanted to bring that discussion up to the group and see if there's any thoughts on what's preferred. So the couple options we have is the standard granite everywhere, which is what's included right now. We could do flush granite at all the locations, so the granite will sit flush with the pavement and the play yard, so it's all one elevation, no tripping hazard. Um, so that would be anticipating to be the same price as what we have right now since it's the same amount of granite, but that is a lot of money to just bury in the ground and make flush with everything. So another option we have is by two minutes firm curbing at all the locations, which is what you see across the street on Dexter in the parking lot, kind of just runs into the grass. There's a slight uh, gentle incline goes into the grass. It's about three inches in total uh, elevation change. So that's another option and that would be significant cost savings because now we have no granite. It's just by two minutes we need to evaluate that price with being when that if that uh, goes forward. Standard granite curve at the exterior of the loop. Outside, bituminous on the inside, or flush granite curving everywhere. So, if there's any comments or discussion, we'd love to open it up. And Becky? Okay, my first question is why not the flush granite on the inside? Give that as an option. Oh, yeah, sorry. Like the hard flush granite at all locations. No, no, no. So, the hard granite or the tall granite on the outside and the flush granite inside. Yeah, that is an option too. And that would still be but the there's, no, there's no cost savings on that. flush granite curve option, there are stormwater implications, so we do have confidence that we don't have to go back to RIDEM or uh, to the Department of Utilities to um, uh, introduce another review, but there is adjustments that we will have to make if we go with flush granite curving on the interior relative to uh, capturing stormwater. What those specifics are, I don't have anything further on that. Uh, order of magnitude, they seem to not terribly significant on the order of magnitude of you know, 80,000, 80, excuse me. Uh, but it is something that Garofalo is looking at right now for options as well. So. The term flush granite, how do you have a curve flush granite? So it basically captures the edge of the bituminous uh, pavement. So it, it essentially is at the same elevation, the top of curb and, and the asphalt pavement. So it, it, so it, it does not act as a No, it doesn't. You're exactly right. Mm -hmm. That's one perspective. Is there not a concern um, or requirement to have it raised for safety purposes? Cars and buses jump the curbs. So that's where we're looking for feedback. There's no specific requirement for that, but it does seem to lend itself to this discussion we're having right now. Especially the outside is, is coming around. Mm -hmm. My guess is that's where the kids will be standing to get on the buses. Assuming the buses will probably be there before they're released, but if stuff happens, the buses come for different events throughout the day for a, if they're leaving school for to go to a museum or something. Sometimes they're out there waiting for the bus and comes up. So just to... The intent would be to 
have the kids wait where it says bus drop off right there. You have the uh, handicap accessibility as well. burn detail is just, I mean, it, it, granite will be stronger than precast, granite will be uh, more, uh, it'll have a long-term uh, view compared to the bituminous berm, but the bituminous berm as spec is a right dot detail, so it's integral to the pavement, it's not added after the fact, so it is a right dot standard, it is a, a Newport DPU standard, Newport DPU has installed in plowable areas bituminous berm. Um, in a similar scenario across the city for their own property for their own properties so it's not something I wouldn't deter away from the bituminous berm because of that and in fact the other you know catch-22 bituminous berm uh, it would be easier to get over the snow into the center if you were plowing in that manner if they were using that as stockpile for snow or things like that so there's, there's different pros and cons. detail right here. On the right side you have your pavement and then it gently slopes up to the plane of the play field or the yard. The old, the old basketball 
before it was bituminous pavement. It just didn't have an edge on the uh, on the sides. Yeah, it depends on the base course, and what you'll have here is the ride out standard for um, heavy loading, so for high, uh, heavy traffic, so buses, tractor trailers, things like that. So it's a different standard that they'll they'll provide for a traffic area for pedestrian traffic versus vehicle. Not asphalt. It ultimately, in the long term, if you want to tack code and things like that, that's a that's a very long term discussion. It's exactly the same stuff. Yeah, so it's asphalt. Asphalt, bituminous pavement, they're the same things. Yep. It's less costly, <laughs> and I think for the respective application, each has its own uh, pro for different applications. In the long term, it is not as resilient. But if we compare it to the property right now, the bituminous berm that we're talking about is the same material, it's the same edge of pavement at the islands across the street from the parking lot. So how they lip up, that's the same material as well. Uh, long term costing. Yeah, it's effectively a one and done with granite. Um, it, it's it's part of the longer term, longer program, right? It's bituminous berm or granite, right? Um, granite being longer term. I can't speak to specifics exactly. But the concern with the granite merely that uh, we've conveyed, that the team conveyed, is if the center area is going to be um, a playground area, you have this sharp granite edge and there's going to be kids running around the bus loop, there's going to be kids inside that area. It just lends itself to a safety concern. From an aesthetic standpoint, I think the one you're thinking about, a berm, like an exaggerated berm, that's, uh, uh, that's the cheap option and more of a the detail for the RIDOT standards. It's more of just the Pitch slope. Dan. Yeah, that's doable as well. Yep. So, so we, um, we hadn't considered that so far just because of uh, the reaction to the precast curb option and how we still have some precast curb option across the street only marrying into where existing is. Um, so that was, that certainly could be reviewed, definitely. So um, I, I received this verbally uh, over the weekend from our site and subcontractor. We can chamfer the edge and we can get a, a if we chamfer the edge, there's not a cost increase, supposedly. Again, that was verbally, so I need to follow up with that. We can do, there are definitively, like, completely scoped granite curves. That increases the cost. So chamfer, more than likely not, 99%, just need to confirm. Slope, definitively. It would... <laughs>
Across the street is more of a straight shot, really. The parking lot. This will be a loop, so bus is turning. Inevitably, are going to run the curb or the grass over. not reflected on the drawings, but I guess we can explore the handicapped ramp into the center play yard. But there is one um, on the bus drop-off side there. Correct. Flush or berm on the inside, right. still have the tripping hazard because it's a great difference. But yes, it's not true. I've come away with is uh, the flush being apparently the the main goal from the group as one option, and that will incur stormwater implications that I need to modify and return to the team. The other one is granite, but sloped, not chamfered, and how much that costs, and that'll just be at the center. And then in all of these options, it'll just be granite around the exterior. I would think. If there's no cost, we do the slight chamfer around the edge. Uh, 
considering there would be no cost implication. That seems to me to make the most sense. Um, and those are really the two, the two options, unless there's anything else. No, the, and the flush, uh, flush or sloped at a considerable angle at the inside. On the outside, still have the chamfer that is within the budget that we've currently priced. Once I could. It's slightly, yeah. It's an east edge, for lack of better terms. It's it's an east it's an east nine. It's still a ninety degree corner, that's just eased slightly. Yeah. So then, if a kid falls into it, it's less of a ninety degree corner of granite. Yeah. Maybe a bump instead of a laceration. You know. Outside is a definite, the standard curve. All right, next item the change order working group. I apologize that says subcommittee, but I learned we don't say that, so it's working group. Um, all right, so Becky and Louisa have been working to form a group, change order group, with uh, the school building committee here which is going to review the project change orders and recommend approval to the remainder of the group and then to the school committee. So the first meeting for that group is going to be on October 12th. So that way any change orders that get approved can be presented to the October 18th SBC meeting. And I'll be sending out like a welcome email with you know, expectations and the process to the members of that group. So I'll send that out this week. Any builder would say 50 grand, but yeah, I mean, 20 grand is reasonable, I think.
schedule update. So we went over some items uh, earlier on there, and I know Jeremy has a good schedule update, so I'm just going to leave that one to him right now. Uh, the budget update, I did include the spreadsheet in the backup that shows the owner contingency currently at $263,497, and the only change to that to date was the adjustment to, to that for the final GMP. So no change orders have been processed through the contingency yet. That'll be after our first meeting on the 12th and then the 18th. That's good. So any questions before I let Jeremy come up and do his job? Thank you, Kyle. Uh, try to keep this brief. So uh, in terms of municipality approvals, we received as of this morning uh, Newport DPU's uh, stormwater approval, which is great. Last uh, tail end of last week, we received uh, the RIPTES permit from RIDEM. So we've made through our, our stormwater hurdle, which is excellent. And the city and uh, Fuss and O'Neill are initiating and continuing their uh, global review of the stormwater, um, legacy stormwater issues. Uh, so that'll be an ongoing process uh, separate to the, the BBI J team, but obviously we're here to facilitate and support Newport Public Schools with that. I think the, the cumulative message there is that Newport Public Schools has done their due diligence with the current team relative to that, that issue. There have been dollars appropriated to what we can do on site, and this is sort of the next step to really do the due diligence for the abutters, right? That's more or less. That's a statement yeah. for, for confirmation. <laughs> um, so, so we're in good shape stormwater-wise. We did receive the building permit, which is excellent. Um, and so we get into, uh, we completed the egress and enabling work so our students and staff can be separate from construction prior to the September 8th start date. Uh, we have installed the electrical feeders through the building before the September 8th start date, which is great. Um, our sewer tie-in is complete. Uh, there was obstruction in the roadway in two different directions, so we did reroute our sewer. Uh, and that has yielded a change order that uh, we have uh, are going to present to uh, Downs, so that'll be part of the subcommittee review, uh, an unforeseen condition. Uh, the existing fire service has <coughs> uh, been relocated. We have not tied into it yet. The chlorination report um, is pending as of my knowledge right now. It could be uh, that it passed. We have a test to do for the Newport Fire Department that we are doing off hours prior to tying in the new fire service, but currently there is fire service active to the building, the sprinkler is on, and we have uh, proceeded with construction in a manner that the NFD has allowed us to, uh, in terms of the live uh, fire service under the footings. Um, foundation footings, as we reported, are complete. Uh, moving forward, uh, we did, at the end of last week, pour the north south and west walls into this week and next week we are working on the east walls forming and pouring them and then we are moving into backfilling all the way to subgrade uh, slab subgrade we will be pouring the 
uh, higher footings for the CMU walls in the centrally located area of the building uh, so that we can start CMU walls on these stair shafts next week, the 8th, the, the tail end of next week, as well as the central uh, CMU walls. Uh, so uh, basically the, the block walls is what I keep referring to as CMU, and there's two two-story towers, one for the stairs on the west side of the building, and then the bathrooms are two stories, and they're block, block walls, not all needs to happen before steel. Uh, so very critical and uh, currently targeting where we need it to be. Um, after that, structural steel is uh, slated for early November, um, and then pouring the slabs mid to end of November so that we are framing the outside shell of the building and getting us tight uh, towards the end of November, early December, consistent with our initial thoughts. Um, we did start the foundation a tad bit later than anticipated because of that sewer obstruction, and uh, we're trying to make up for that since, although there's been no uh, delay to the long-term goal of August 1st, 2022. bought all of it. So I just think that's something we should hear as the school building community. Is that having an impact on the outcome? So raw material um, for this project was secured when we were procured when we were awarded the project and we awarded Shaman. Decking was the loose cannon and is still a loose cannon. They've committed to October. They haven't been able to commit to any other date other than October. Uh, seeing that we're currently forecasting early November to erect steel um, where we're confident that we will have it in time. Um, right now, it's 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 not as confident as we usually are because of your exact issue. But we did do our due diligence to release the steel immediately upon award for decking. We actually normally you wait through shop drawings and then you release the steel. You cut it in the fabrication shop. In this case, we reacted by saying, "Okay, we're we're releasing the decking a couple inches longer." We go through the shop drawings and then. The, stat, the start of that material procurement is happening while we're working out the details, and then ultimately when we receive that, we cut it to length on site. So we reacted that differently. So we, we're doing everything we can to do that. Um, and then from a raw material perspective and steel in the initial design, we worked away from steel bar joists because that was a impact at the time. There were months out, so we worked through that with O'Day. Uh, so we're just we're reacting to those things. Uh, but right now, early November, shooting for and we don't see it we don't foresee a problem with that right now. Um, in terms of procurements steel being one uh, drainage has been released that is a long lead item uh, steel fabrication is ongoing like I said the brick veneer has been released the storefronts have been released finished flooring uh, except for the stair treads have been released and MEP equipment submittals are ongoing. Some of the critical early items, such as roof curves and things like that, have been released. Um, so now, as Kyle mentioned, we're working through sort of the ongoing uh, mis miscellaneous submittals. Phil and I just walked through casework. He's going to be coming up with uh, um, suggestions based on the current uh, material samples that we reviewed, and we'll take that. We'll let that take its course. Uh, Keynotes overall: the bus loop was approved. I think that was a great part of the project that uh, is worth mentioning. And we are working with Phil on, to, uh, on obviously, the school administration to refine the Welcome Center scope so that we have a complete package by November 6th. And Kathy, if you could, did you get that email from Phil to share the Welcome Center? Okay. All right, that'd be perfect. We'll just let Kathy take a couple minutes and we can talk about the Welcome Center if the group feels necessary. Okay.
want to quickly describe some of the changes you would expect uh, in the new Welcome Center because it does impact not only the opportunity to welcome uh, newcomers to the school, but also uh, addresses some operational issues that the administration has sort of uh, worked through since the building opened. So let's start with a secure entrance into the school. This is your current vestibule. We're going to be addressing the door hardware to make it electronic so that it's lockable. But as a visitor to the building, to the vestibule, this office, the credentials check. set of doors in the building. So this is certainly a security measure of how the building is operating right now. And the wall administration public area have been open to create a little bit more privacy. unused circulation is there right now. We're also creating an entrance to the nurse's office from the cafeteria side as opposed to the side of the that were there in case of an emergency, but we'll keep students from entering in the administration area. The other entrance vestibule, we're looking to do the same thing in terms of creating a secure entrance sequence. Outside set of doors, inside window where they could be serviced, and then another set of doors. These are the existing doors. We're just going to change the hardware and make it electronic. Some of the biggest changes you'll see in both vestibules. On both sets of stairs, we're going to be rotating the doors that you currently have at the bottom of the stairs and discharging them to the side. have the display cases on. On this side, the larger side, we're going to make a welcome center. And on the other side, we're going to add two offices. like your administration area does now, you know, maybe a half wall and then glass above. So there's a lot of there and over there with a set of aluminum storefront doors. Again, a lot of transparency, electronically controlled in case they need to be closed. a safe room off of a special ed classroom. A113 as special education. Safe room directly accessed off the classroom. cost-effectively. There is the sewer line that runs right down through there. So we're going to tap off of it in the existing janitor's closet for the new bathroom that I just showed you. And then tap it again for the new janitor's closet. So we are going to be and brothers can put together the cost associated with this with their subcontractors. Building committee, the school committee can present that to the Van Buren Foundation. But
but I can tell you that we all spend a lot of time looking at this plan and some of the moves are very strategic and certainly create a, a very efficient and complete administration area. going to infill that door, but this is a great suggestion. We can tighten up that bathroom and that closet's only like 20 inches deep. We already have the door there, so you can stack it full of paper or something like that. Great idea. It's, it's it is handicap accessible and it's oversized. So when we reduce it, we will still maintain accessibility. We'll just take advantage of that door opening and a little shallow closet. Great idea.
last item for Pell is the action item for recommendation to the school committee to accept the funds from the Empire Foundation for the bus and drainage. So that can be a motion. Construction and team meetings are ongoing. They continue weekly with the administration and building committee. The work
estimates. Go line by line, make sure everyone, everyone is doing the same stuff. Everyone's carrying the same quantities of materials. That way everyone is estimating apples to apples, not apples to oranges. So after that happens this week, early next week, we have meetings scheduled with the Turtle Newport team to just review everything. And then a um, follow-up meeting with Slam Gilbane the next day, the internal Newport team to just discuss everything, figure out where we're going, and then we'll be coming back to this group, the school building committee, with a review and update of the schematic design right now at the first October school building committee meeting, which is October 18th. Other possible additional funding sources, so we continue to review what's out there. Van Buren Foundation put together a group for us previously that we made a presentation to, which we are planning to do another presentation to once estimates come back in again. So it's kind of been a little bit of a holding pattern, but a lot of things are looking to break loose once we get this estimate done to figure out how we're moving forward. Schedule update, the main thing really is schematic design, so I'm not going to beat that horse anymore. Um, and after that, we're going to reevaluate the rest of our schedule moving forward, where, where that leaves us with design development, construction documents, and then moving forward into early packages for demo and abatement, et cetera, and then remaining construction. Uh, budget update <coughs> was included in the backup, the spreadsheet. There's not much going on with this budget right now, uh, just tracking the payments to Downs and SLAM, and there were some legal fees, I think, from the city small cost that's included in there as well so uh, just continue to track that as we, as we move forward turn it over to slam and Gil uh, just slam if there's any questions before we do that <coughs> very good we need to change <laughs> Good evening, everybody. We're happy to be back talking to you one more time. One of many times, not one more time. I wanted to introduce to you um, Ted Tolis. He is our, pro our project manager, and we've realized that many of you have never met him in person. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that you all know who he is so that if I come with either one of the tall guys yeah. to hide behind or whatever I have to do, it's, it's one of those two, but Ted's, Ted's been with us right from the very beginning. He's, he's uh, well-versed in all things Rogers at this point. So, um, so we have um, some of the same things that you've seen before. The, the floor plans and whatnot are, are continuing to get updated, but they may not look from a distance all that different to you, but that's okay. We have some new graphics and we have some new um, updated renderings. We always start by bringing ourselves back to our four core uh, important items for us, Newport Pride, ex experiential learning, purposeful and resilient design, and sustainable action. So everything that we do is in support of those items. Some of, some of the activities, I'm gonna stand over here. Some of the activities that have been ongoing, we are so we are finishing up our schematic design package. Our, our two estimating teams, the one being ours, the other one being Gilbane's, have had our package now for a month, um, but we have not stopped. We've continued to do work uh, building the rest of that package. So they have that and they have been estimating off of it, but we are continuing to finish up our package. We received on Friday documents from all of our consultants and we're bundling them and packaging them at this point so that um, at such time as we're ready to go deliver something to ride, we have our, all of our documentation in order. Um, so uh, most of the items on this thing are in support of pulling that package together. And as Kyle has so eloquently said, we have continuing meetings all the time uh, to make sure that our team is uh, continually pulling 
growing in the same direction. Uh, cost estimates have been bouncing back and forth between us, our cost estimator, Gil Bain. We've been talking in the background, and Wednesday will be a really important day uh, for getting all of that data pulled together and understood. Just to take you back to, as we always do, where we started, where we are, where we're going. We're basically still on track with all these things. <laughs> I saw Phil doing that with his finger. Um, just so that everybody knows, the square footage that we have agreed to with our two estimators for them to use is 197,000 square feet. That includes all the gray space, that includes everything uh, that we have designed. It does not include automotive, cosmetology, or central office, just to be clear that those things are not in that. Uh, but it does include what you don't see on this image is a small basement space, which is uh, in the back. That, that would be all for mechanical space, but that, that was included in the 197,000 square feet. So that, as Kyle said, we're doing an apples to apples comparison and we've had some pre-meetings to make sure everybody's on the same page with that. You never give a designer an pen in a meeting. It's not going to end well. Just to kind of go through some of the things we've been working on on the design side and some of the design strategies that we've looked at. So that you saw the published. Yeah, so you saw the published, uh, so you saw published 197,000 gross square feet. That's an estimating number. That's not the actual square footage of the building. We're tracking somewhere probably around 190 right now. So we're less than that. But for estimating, estimators take, get, everything gets a little bigger because of, think about when you uh, cut a sheet of plywood, there's some loss that goes to be recycled. It doesn't get put back in the building. So everything just gets rounded up a little bit more than the actual code square footage. So one of the things that we want to do, and I'm going to try to sidestep this guy, is look at some of these costs that have, we've talked about for a bit of time now, like the utility relocations from stage two. By relocating the building, we're going to see on Wednesday when we reconcile these estimates what we were able to do or not do and recover some of those funds that we thought were going to have to be spent on temporary and permanent relocation. We've been continuing to condense the footprint and create the most efficient, effective learning environment uh, for the district. We've been designing with security and, and uh, been really trying to minimize the number of doors in and out of this field facility, make public access really a welcoming, enjoyable event. Uh, so when you go to get your lobster roll, you, get, you, you can celebrate that event and not have to get trampled in a hallway by 800 kids running down the hallway. Uh, so, so we cited the building. We think to mitigate some of the water runoff, that's something that we are still looking at and will be a long discussion item. That's not going to be solved in, in SD. That really happens in design development. So that will continue that process. Uh, we are still designing to net zero principles. and. We are obviously starting with what we call low tech or passive solutions, things that don't require a computer chip to actually make function. And if you've seen all the cars parked in, in Quantum Point and all these other places that don't have computer chips, you can know that's a problem right now. So we're seeing that continuing to uh, become a bigger issue with construction as we look at it, the logistics side. Worked for me. Uh, building orientation, one of the things sustainably we're doing is that, that four-story academic wing. It's long access runs east-west, puts the longest face of the building uh, facing due south. That allows us to harvest as much daylight deeper into the building. So we are doing that. That's a simple move, uh, easy to do, but it allows for deeper daylighting. So your lights aren't on as much during the day. So you save some money there. Simple forms, uh, one of the things that we've learned long ago, simplicity goes a long way when it comes to these facilities. They can be very elegant, nice materials, but if we can reduce the amount of ins and outs, and, and if you went to East Providence and you remember that building, there was a lot of, I'll say exuberance on that exterior facade uh, that cost a lot of money, that gave no net square footage to a child in a seat. So we don't want to do that. So we've been really purposely planning uh, with that in mind. 
in our site analysis, working with uh, Traverse, our landscape architect, and our, our civ site civil, we've been making sure that we are understanding things like cut fill now, do we have a balanced site? One of the things we know is we do not want dirt or soil coming off of this site. In Rhode Island, that's like a bad thing because the, the, the contamination levels by the state are, the thresholds are lower. It's not, you could, if you took the soil and picked it up, to move it to Connecticut where I live, you could eat it. But in Rhode Island, you can't. So it's just a matter of where the thresholds are. So it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Uh, but we're doing all of that due diligence in the background. So there's just a ton of technical conversations that are going on with the, the engineering team to really understand the complexity of, of this opportunity. I have a question. Yes. On number three, you said limited windows. So in Rogers right now, we had a huge problem with gas leaking, you know, like their double pane. Have, yeah. they, have they really improved on that so we know that's not going to happen again? It, it, they have. They have. It'll happen in 50 years again, but yeah, it'll be not. 50 years. Okay. Yeah. So when, when we limit the number of windows, I know that was a discussion point. I can tell you the number now. We have 25,000 gross square feet of windows in the building. So think about that. 25,000 square feet of glass. That's a lot of glazing. So that's getting daylighting and visual transparency, all the things that we wanted. And that's just on the exterior. That's not including the interior glazing. So any other questions about any sort of design principles or... Just to go over the site quickly, we've, we've uh, really just been refining things. I'm going to point to the puddle, just so people know where the puddle is. It literally is a puddle. So if somebody wanted to go take a lawnmower over there, you know, just saying. <laughs> but one of the things that we know is there's been significant settlement in a track, which has caused a lot of runoff to collect in areas. And yes, there are plantings there that are technically classified as wetland plantings, but it's in a puddle. It's just because the water has been continually running to that spot because it's a man-made condition. So that's something that we think we can get relief from and address because it's important to us to get that out of the way because we need to make that track viable and work. It gets a little wider and we're rotating the track ever so slightly. So you'll just see the last time when we dropped the footprint on, this is really just to show uh, what has to happen in early demo. We're still looking at demoing the auditorium. We're still looking at demoing the gym and a small portion of the, the stairs that come out of the cafeteria to make way for new construction. Uh, the building footprint that you see in orange outlined in white uh, stays a minimum of 30 feet away from the rest of the facility so you can construct it safely without any other additional code barriers. We're continuing to work through that. Uh, with Gilbane, and when we look at their site and logistics plan, we'll have a better understanding of, do we need to move the building a couple more feet? Do we have to tweak something a little bit just to make sure it's a safe environment to construct and the kids can occupy the rest of the facility without any issue? Mark, when you work with that footprint, does that include the automotive, cosmetology? You know, that does not. I'll show you where those things are added. So we have a comp, we understand how to add those. Yep. So I'll show Let's you. Take So one of the benefits of uh, continuing, as we add more information, the drawings get harder and harder to show. It's all 
the, the big graphics. Yeah. 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 All right, so let's try this again. The problem is the, these files are so large and graphically intense that I think it's just overburdening the processor and the TV. So what we've been doing is, is working with our, our internal design team to really make sure that we fundamentally understand traffic flow on the site where Chevron buses are. Now, Kathy, if you want to point to a couple of those things. This is where Kathy and I will start moving the screen, uh, where we have uh, student drop-off or parking over in that location. We have additional parking behind in the back loading dock in the upper left-hand corner. The track you can see has rotated a little bit. That gets it on a better solar orientation. It also allows us to make it a little wider and get it to fit a little better. We pull it away from the neighborhoods on the, the right-hand side. The next one blows it up so you can see a little bit more of what we're doing. Uh, we have dining basically on the edge over kitchen overlooking the field so if you wanted to do events there you could do that we have a main entry plaza car drop off uh, a lot of parking we do have bioretention in between the parking so as water runs off it's captured in the medians instead of running cheap water uh, running down the road back into the community we have mostly the additional what's labeled additional parking is in the back uh, could be for the buses if you need to park, park the extra buses here it also really is a service yard. If we do add in the automotive and, and cosmetology, automotive would be here. Cosmetology would be there. And the central office would be adjacent to where the, uh, the main office is at the main drop-off. We still are showing that uh, extra uh, flex field. That is a full-size soccer field now. So we're able to fit a full-size soccer field. Are you with um, setbacks? Is that no issue. No. 
It's still yeah. as close on the, on the it's, it's a little close on Wickham Road, um, but with the way it lays out with biasing it in this direction, it's showing the shorter side of the building to Wickham Road. We do chamfer the building, step it a little bit. So there's an outcropping of rock there and some trees, a few of which we're trying to miss because they are nice specimen trees. As we've continued to develop the plan, a lot of the smaller spaces, a lot of the spaces that Jared, we worked out uh, together on call, uh, we've been able to accommodate that, get everything the way that uh, I believe works really, really well from that secure entrance, ninth grade academy, here, ALP, uh, added media design, uh, kitchen, the black box theater, the courtyard, the media center, the gym in green. Uh, we've got surf building support in the gray, and I should say we've had some discussions about gray space, and gray space is something that you either you, you need it for a bathroom or that's a corridor. Some of those corridors are a little wider where you can sit in it, but we are tracking about 63% efficiency, and I think we had told you we'd be about 62.7, I think, or 62.5. Uh, we keep trying to up the efficiency. Every time I look at the plan, I take a little bit out, I find some space that doesn't need to be there, and I just keep carving away at it. But it is a pretty elegant plan in the way it sits on the site, the way the, the four-story academic wing faces Wickham Road with views back out uh, in both directions will be phenomenal. Uh, great community access to all the spaces where the community needs to come. The public access has been really thought out very well uh, working with your team. Before you move on, can you show on that one as well where the Cosmo Auto will be? Yeah. It'd be separated completely. The thing with auto is we want that traffic not to be mixed up with the main traffic. Right now, as you come in the front door, that's what you're seeing is all the, the cars and the parts and everything out there. The kitchen is really an internal function. Uh, it gets its access through the loading dock, which I'll just point here. So the auto out of here allows for the most optimal approach for a community to come in, bring their cars, and for the kids to be able to work on those cars safely. It really creates that sort of service side of the building versus the very, very public. We definitely didn't want to mix food and auto. And well, that's why I was yeah, like. the, the culinary kitchen food and the public coming in, but this works out pretty well. Okay. What we're showing you now, this is from our Revit model. So we basically take the three-dimensional, everything, the 2D plan you saw is built in three dimensions down to the bleachers in the gymnasium. So this is a section through that looking at just the first floor. So you could see how those spaces interrelate. You can see where the media center is, where the courtyard, that the black box theater, the cafe seating, student commons, that thoroughfare that runs through. You're seeing the start of a, a nice stair. It's kind of a media wall as you enter, sort of uh, information display of what's going on in the school. Uh, if I'm going to a game, I'm going there. If I'm going to a performance in the black box, I know where I'm going. Again, we have the ability on the academic side to really lock that tower down so community functions can happen. Much like Phil was talking about adding the doors over here, to be able to use this space effectively, you do want to close down in a modern school the rest of the building. Main office, nurse, the school nurse in a good spot, so during a pandemic that unfortunately doesn't seem to want to end, we have the ability to get folks out of there without crossing the main public path. So we really thought about how to do that in a, in a really nice way. Uh, for everyone. Ninth grade academy, ALP, added media design, uh, custodial often to the back, construction technology, culinary kitchen, the seating for the culinary kitchen, and, and then outside of that seating, there's an outdoor plaza, so you, during nice days you can be outside or take advantage of an event on the field and overlook that. Where do people park for the culinary kitchen? They park. Yeah, so we have so, handicap parking closer. Okay. Yeah. Yep. On the second floor, you can see the little image of the gymnasium off in the lower right-hand corner. All the green is that uh, walking track around the gym. We have athletic locker rooms, junior ROTC, sort of on that half. 
the bridge between the gym and the academic building is guidance offices right at the top of the stairs, so easy access. We've been really working hard to get uh, each floor to have a floor captain, so there is oversight on those floors. Uh, you're starting to see on these floors some of the breakout spaces show up in different locations and in different scales. They're not the huge rooms. We've taken that square footage and spread it around. So it's right, so there's lots of eyes on those spaces. So as kids go out to work in teams, instead of sitting on a floor right now next to the lockers, they're, they'll be in purposeful chairs and uh, tables working there in an effective way. As we stack up in the building, you can see the walking track overlooking the gymnasium below, where the team locker rooms, junior ROTC, you see the entrance canopy, guidance offices that bridge, literally between the athletics and the academics. Uh, special education, some of the spaces showing up here. Classrooms, classrooms on every floor. As we talked before, classroom is a classroom is a classroom. It's there to be programmed for by multiple groups, so it's not specific to a, a discipline. IT Academy in, over in the upper uh, left corner. Faculty workroom, one of those on each floor, so they stack in the same location. It gives oversight as well uh, to each floor. We also have office spaces in that location on each of the floors where we are able to pull a few people out of the main office and get them as a floor captain on that floor so it's appropriate. Going up to the third floor, more classroom space. You see some of the breakout spaces outside the classrooms, again with great visual acuity from the classroom to those outside spaces. Uh, those breakout spaces, very simple floor plan diagram. Elevators off to the right will have tremendous views at the end of that corridor out. Uh, to the water, which will be fantastic. As we stack up, the gym is still a little taller than the second floor where the basketball courts would be. You can see the track, the remnants of the track, and where the fitness room is. The third floor of the, the academic tower, you can see that glass corner that would overlook uh, the water in the distance. The fourth floor, mainly uh, classroom heavy floor, STEM labs, computer labs, teacher workroom, floor captains in the blue on the end over here, great views out, no enclosed breakout spaces. Everything is open so the kids don't have to choose to open a door, it doesn't get clicky. So if there's an open seat and I want to use it, I'll feel comfortable being able to use it. So Mark, just back to your point of the gray space, those breakout spaces are part of that gray space, correct? Those are programmed. Some of them are, it's technically yes and no. Some of them are programmed. You know, with Amy, we have, a, we have a number of seats that I can accommodate. Uh, some of them I'm finding just through planning that we're able to get some. Some of them technically, yes, would count, come from the gray space. So the fourth floor, very similar uh, plan diagram to the floor below. You can see the barrel roof of the gymnasium show up. Uh, again, it's a very tight, condensed footprint. Top, put the cap on the academic tower. Those roofs shaped for solar, ideally. You can also do solar on the barrel vault, half of it that faces me. And then the next couple images, we show two different versions. So we show a gray version, and this is just for color. It's not for materiality yet. We'll get into those discussions, especially after Wednesday, we'll get into those discussions. So we have a gray one, and I show a beige one. So we go sort of cool tones and warmer tones, just to sort of see. So this is, we will be getting into this, but it's, so we'll go back and forth a hundred times on this one. So, but I, we wanted to show you different things to lighten it up. And again, this is in our computer model. It's easy for us to toggle between materials and colors. And uh, once we get into design development, we'll really be defining what these are. But just to give you an idea of what I'm thinking, that panel right there is a mahogany look panel. It's not real mahogany. It's an aluminum panel that looks like mahogany, but it gives a warmth, a wood warmth to the tone. The red is the red, so that's the school red. We use that very sparingly. Uh, I want to make fun of East Providence, but that, like I said last time, there's more red there uh, than any other color, and it's just too much. It's, it's just overloaded. So we have the red where it's appropriate, and we use it as a, a way to punch or break up the building mass. I have a question for you. Yes. Okay, so this may be too late to ask, but when we were at East Providence, those of us that got the opportunity to go, we saw those presentation stairs or places for kids to sit. Do you see that we could still fit something like that in? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it was a 
just for those of you that didn't go, it was, I have a picture of it right here, but what would you call it, like a lecture? Like it's a, I call it a steratorium. But a steratorium, yeah. 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 yeah, I can pass this picture up there. Um, and anyway, just, it's just a thought. The teachers really enjoyed those and thought they were, they were yeah. you know. So my view of those is in the cafeteria space is where I'd be doing that. So as you, if you were on this end of the cafeteria looking back, you would see that in front of you. So you could actually use that for a, a gathering or students could sit there comfortably after they're done before they have to go back to class. So Mark, is that what you, because you did show that sort of now in the middle of mm -hmm. the cafeteria. So you, you would you plan those kind of stairs yep. in there? Yep. Okay. Yep. So you circulate on both sides to get around that. It gives me a great spot as you come into the front entry to have the media wall or the, the story wall that tells the story of Rogers right. and every, all the great things that are happening in there. Oh. We might be uh, bringing boards next time. <laughs> gray, not gray. We'll go to the next one. So this one, again, what you're not seeing any of these are the, the lighting yet. You know, we, we haven't put it in, sort of geo-positioned it exactly in Newport, so the Newport sun this time of year, all that kind of stuff. We also don't have all the lights turned on in the building. That, we're adding that level of information into the model, and that really will help us uh, really amp up these rendering. These are very quick for us to do. These are more for, for me to study with the team, the general massing in. And I heard the color about the gray, so I wanted to show something other than gray, just to show you a warmer palette. She was texting me, yeah. yeah. And again, on approach, uh, bringing some warmth of wood, ideally, into that canopy. So there's kind of a, a rich heritage of shipbuilding and wood in the community. Bringing some of that into the building here uh, is a really nice thing just to break the scale and you can see it in, in more of a the beige tone versus the gray tone. I think. And Jim, as we continue to develop the gym, you know, we're going to make this a, a really cool place to play and make the other team scared to play here. So. Believe it or not, wood for those trusses is, is more economical than steel by a long shot right now. There's also a code exception that allows us not to fireproof heavy timber effectively in a Type 2B building without getting too technical. If we had steel up there, given the height off the gym floor, we wouldn't have to protect it. But because we have the fitness room or the track, we'd have to protect uh, anything under 20 feet. We'd have to have a two-hour rating effectively. So that gets to be expensive to do. So we are, as I think, what do we say? So we're, we're working with the cost estimators, so that is uh, Wednesday is D-Day when we really reconcile our estimates. And as Kyle mentioned, we want oranges and oranges. We don't want apples and, and grapes. You know, we really need to make sure that the estimators estimated what we were putting into the documents and what we anticipated and didn't read too much into it. So that's a natural occurrence that happens. Uh, so we have that schedule for Wednesday. We'll review with the owner's working group. We will. Uh, Everybody's going to be making suggestions as we look at this. We know there is still significant pressure in the industry on costs. I think you're still seeing it on Bell. In some cases, uh, we're seeing it uh, steel deck if you didn't order it ahead of time and a brilliant move. Six month lead time. Insulation for roof insulation, six month lead time. I don't even want to talk about air handlers if you haven't gotten it in the queue. So there's a lot of pressure right now and it's, and it's it is labor force pressure more than it is material cost pressure, and there's just no truck drivers to drive this stuff around. It's just become a nightmare for the industry. And we'll work, once we get all of this run through everyone, uh, we'll come back, we'll present it all, because there will probably be decisions we have to make together and uh, shepherd through the process and ultimately get the package to be submitted to Ride, who is anxious to see this, I know. I don't know how authoritative the commission is, the tree commission. Let's see where you're putting the, the 
um, soccer field and all that, there's quite a high number of, of mature trees in yeah. that area. So we've, we've gone through and with our uh, landscape architect, I know Chris Bradner has met Scott and they've tagged a bunch of trees or have tagged on a plan trees that are worth keeping and trees that might be at I got in trouble saying this to a landscape architect once before. Trees that might be the end of their useful life. And the landscape ar architect asked me, well, how do you know that? You're just an architect. But you know, you get the right people to look at those trees, and, and uh, they've gone ahead and done that and tagged that. I think that's something we should get a document together to share with you all. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it's been a process. And some we have to relocate. Some can't stay in their current location. It doesn't mean they get cut down. They get relocated. Correct. Any questions by everybody? Yes, uh, one question, Mark. So yeah. since these designs don't include the ad alternate, the uh, central office, Automotive, et cetera. How do you get to the cost on that to actually go? Because we've project? described that in uh, some cases, sketch form and, and elaborate narratives. Yeah, so, so we've. Square footage yeah, and exactly. And they're costing that. So we'll have that, that uh, menu of, of okay, items. But they won't be in the schematic design. No. no. But for ad alternatives, you have those things in there. And you have. There is a. I think I know in the email that went out to everybody here and so on, it's a sustainability working group that he talked about because we had several people from the community reached out and I know Lynn has said she will be on it. If there's anybody else here who's interested to be on the sustainability working group, please just let us know or you can raise your hand right now. Um, but there, just because uh, sustainability is a big thing and Climate Rhode Island Act, so both Dawn Warrior and Lauren Carson are on that as well. So as well as a lot of other people with an eye interested in that. But they're costing out um, solar on the rooftops, uh, geothermal in two different locations. They shared that at the last meeting with us here. Mm -hmm. And they are also um, specking out, I believe, solar parking lots in the mid, right? Oh, right. Yeah, we're, we're looking at really high-tech bathrooms, too, with uh, you know, where you put your hands under water immediate on and off and the soap dispenser in the sink and the dryer maybe. So uh, we're hoping to maybe try one out here at Pell hmm. when we do the new bathroom. We'll put it in there, you know, see what, the, what everybody thinks of it. So that's a re recent Rogers graduate who's got involved with that project. Yeah, and she's working on all the things you told her to for this week. So it's great. We get kids involved in this project. And and next, too, we, we want to look at maybe trying to uh, pilot some of the tables for the, uh, you know, table and chairs for the, um, the teachers and also for the cafeteria, just so we can, you know, you hate to make a big investment when you haven't really tried them out to see what, you know, if they're comfortable and, and the custodians don't want to kill you. So we will also be preparing uh, packages to present to the funders again as well, with the cost information to go with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Great job. Yeah. Yes. Adjourning.
Thank you. 